Okay. Um, so thank you for inviting me here. Um, my name is Sarah Molina. I work in the National Park Service and our Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate. So I work in sort of the same level of the organization or similar as ARENA. Um, and I was happy to have ARENA reach out to me for this. Um, I'm going to share some of the projects that I've been involved in to design and implement campaigns um, to encourage conservation among Park Service visitors. I, I will say um, I too look at our social media campaigns constantly and um, you know I can't necessarily take credit for those. Matt Turner in the uh, Washington office um, manages our social media account and he is amazing um you know and i'm hoping part of you know the way we think about how we reach visitors um you know is is helping change how people are you know engaging in park you know visiting our parks experiencing our parks so um as i said i'm located in fort collins colorado i will say i'm afraid is everything okay people are coming up um Okay, I'm located in Fort Collins, Colorado. I grew up on the peninsula. And so listening to everybody talk about the, the Bay Area, um, talk about the coast is near and dear to my heart. My brother lives in Santa Cruz. Um, I'd like to think that at Christmas, we have gone over and gotten crab um, from Dick Ogg's boat because that is part of our Christmas tradition. So it's been lovely listening to everybody here today. Um, so in 2018, I presented at this uh, symposium and we just finished testing our first social marketing campaign to encourage safe wildlife viewing distances in national parks. And we were pretty happy with the results. I worked closely with Kirsten Leong, who was formerly in the National Park Service and now works at NOAA and Katie Abrams at Colorado State University. Um, in 2021, Katie and, or Kirsten came and presented some work she had done with Katie encouraging safe viewing distances um, from sea turtles on Hawaii's beaches. And then this year, um, I've worked with Katie and we have results from a campaign to encourage proper food storage in parks. And more recently, we've been learning about visitors' responses to a campaign to encourage the use of mineral-based sunscreens to protect park waters. Um, and I just want to point out, as I was listening to the Marine Mammal Center, notice that protect yourself and then protect the reef. So we are focused very much on the personal experience of the visitor that are coming to our parks. Um, as I've been looking around, I've started to see more and more examples of social marketing behavior change strategies being used to influence conservation. So this uh, project in the Chesapeake Bay is a resource for local communities and organizations committed to protecting the watershed. And it follows a similar approach that the Marine Mammal Was Center took. They went and they surveyed um, communities around the watershed to understand you know, what actions visitor or the local community would likely take um, to protect the watershed. Another really great example is from Minnesota and the Department of Natural Resources is using social marketing as the framework for a project uh, to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And so these are all grounded in the idea that to achieve conservation goals, we need to focus on behavior. And this has been a guiding concept for me. Um, and so through the examples that I'm sharing um, and the work that I've been doing, I've been focusing on developing strategies that complement our education and enforcement approaches. So Kirsten and Katie and I um, have been using a social marketing framework to understand and design our behavior change campaigns. Social marketing uses traditional marketing principles and techniques to increase the uptake of behaviors um, and the behaviors that benefit society as well as the individual. So, you know, we can think about how this fits alongside education and enforcement in that um, education can be really powerful for people who may be motivated by a conservation mission and ready to do what's asked of them or would benefit, you know, can support building a long-term stewardship ethic among visitors and community. Uh, 
but not everybody's going to be interested in learning. And then on the other end of the spectrum, um, they're going to be people who just aren't motivated by a conservation message and may never be. And enforcement is a required tool. What I propose and what I've been trying to do is add social marketing to our toolbox um, and focus on the people that think the behavior is a good idea, but may also see a lot of barriers to doing it. So maybe they need um, just a reminder of what to do, how to act. Or they look around and say, well, nobody else is picking up their campsites. Why should I be the only one to do it? And so they just revert to what the norm is. Um, or they're driven by convenience. What is the easiest thing for me to do? And if the easiest thing is also aligned with the conservation focus, then we're in really great shape. So the way I kind of think about it is I want to focus on the people that just a need a little nudge to participate. They need a reminder. They need it just to be what you do. Social marketing has been widely used in the public health arena. Um, the CDC has a wealth of information on social marketing campaigns to do things like decrease smoking, prevent the spread of AIDS, um, encourage immunization. And then, you know, as you start to look around, there are a lot of other sectors that are adopting social marketing behavior change strategies to encourage behaviors that benefit society. And I've been listening and sort of hearing this throughout um, many of the most recent presentations. So, you know, some examples, um, this one is encouraged at biking. I went poking around their website and saw, you know, the campaign is built around behavior change theory. Um, I don't know, but many of you may get a uh, report like this in your energy bills, and it is um, designed to reinforce the norms of the area and has been shown to be very effective at um, encouraging uh, energy conservation. And then there's this one about um, living in bear country. In 2014, the Conserva Society for Conservation Biology established the Conservation um, Marketing and Engagement Work Group to advance the study and practice of using marketing techniques to advance conservation goals and held their first conference in 2018. Um, so to me, this says this is you know, I, I see scatterings of um, social marketing in, cons in um, sustainability conservation, and I feel like it is really starting to pick up because 2018, although right now feels like a lifetime ago, is really not all that far in years, just a few years ago. Um, I really like this quote, um, which I pulled from a, a, a paper, um, and it talks about how social marketing focuses on the idea of exchange with both sides willing to exchange, um, engage in a transaction, engage in an exchange and happy with the outcomes. And I love thinking about this in terms of the mission, the National Park Service mission. So it's not so much a dual mission of conservation and enjoyment. It's if we provide a great visitor experience, you will help us conserve. So that it's an exchange instead of a dual mission. Social marketing draws on social science fields. It relies on good data. So it was awesome to hear some of the presentations coming up because it is just a foundation of a strong campaign and being able to target the audiences and the locations that you need to. Um, it uses theory informative research to design an effective communication brooch. And I think the key element here um, that adds to you know, an education information approach is this one, social marketing focuses on behavior. It emphasizes behavior as the desired outcome. So you know, I would add to that to say, it's om a little flippant, but it's almost like I don't care if people know why they are doing the right thing. It's just that they are doing it, setting up the framework and the environment so that they do the right thing because that's just what you do. So the first step is to select behaviors and to be very specific about what you're looking for. Um, there are a couple sort of examples here. You know, if we're thinking about preventing negative human wildlife interactions and keeping wildlife wild, 
Um, that could be, you know, thinking about if the issue is primarily about people properly storing food in a location, or is it about, um, you know, preventing intentional feeding of wildlife, or is it knowing what to do when wildlife approach you? Or adding to that, I didn't find a perfect picture. Is it cleaning up micro trash in a campsite? Or is it storing non food scented items? So like, you know, wonderful smelly lotions and sunscreens. Um, so maybe people have put away all the food, but they haven't thought about those scented items that could also be attractants. And we wanna be very specific about what the behaviors are that we are looking to target. Then the next thing we think about is um, how do we prioritize those? You know, we could have a long list of behaviors and you kind of want to do all the different things, all the things um, to get people to do what you want them to do, but we don't have the time and energy and resources to do that. So we really have to prioritize what to focus on. Um, and like I said, I am going to add the Marine Mammal Center's example here because I thought that was fantastic. Um, the one that I'm going to share two examples that I look at um, frequently as models for how to do this. The Minnesota Department of Natural Resources um, focus, had been developing a strategy to minimize the spread of aquatic invasive species. And so they went and looked through literature and did expert interviews and came up with 150 discrete behaviors that could be um, that could prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. That was broken down into five sectors. And the example here is like release of live bait, live bait being a vector for the spread of aquatic invasives. And then they they went and they rated across three categories of you know, if we focus on this behavior, are we going to have a big impact? Um, is there a high likelihood of uptake that people would actually do this if we, you know, said, hey, this is the behavior we want you to engage in. Are people likely to, to start doing that? And then how big is the market? And so you can see pretty quickly here where you spend your time and energy, both um, visually inspecting bait stocks an intentional release of live bait could have a very high impact if we could manage those. But, you know, the likelihood of visually inspecting all bait stock is much lower than, you know, anglers or fishers um, disposing of their unused bait in the garbage. So we're going to spend our time and energy on the one that we're going to have the, you know, greatest impact uptake and market. I mentioned this example earlier, the um, Chesapeake Bay program, and there's a fantastic webinar that dives into how they went about doing it. And as I was thinking about this presentation, um, this example came to mind because across communities in the coastal area, you know, you think what are all the range of behaviors that our communities, you know, that we would want to focus on in these communities. And Chesapeake Bay went out and did surveys and asked, you know, what's the likelihood that you would um, pick up your dog waste? And are you doing this already? And they were able to, you know, develop scores that again, helped prioritize which behaviors um, the communities should focus on to have the greatest impact. So after that, you know, the next step, um, we'll look at barriers and benefits to engaging in the behavior. Um, and we'll want to promote the behaviors we want to see, make it um, motivate people to take action, um, and then make it harder to do the things we don't want them to do. So this example is from Kirsten and Katie um, on taking photos of sea turtles, and they were trying to motivate people to take long distance by photos by sharing examples of, you know, what that could look like, you know, those Instagram friendly um, photos to share that also emphasized the distance or required you to have the distance to take the photo. So my most recent example, the most recent project I've been working on was designed in partnership with Katie Abrams at Colorado State University. And our goal was to design and test a campaign to encourage food storage. Um, 
As was said earlier, our common approach to food storage messaging focuses on the regulation and protecting wildlife. Um, but if a great day with my family is my primary motivator, that message may not land. So Katie reframed the food storage messaging to support desired visitor experience of having an awesome stress-free camping trip. So the messaging focused around low stress, you know, I'm going out to have a great time with my family, emphasizing what other people are doing, you know, giving tips and tools to make it easy. And then, um, you know, for adding a little bit about what visitors might lose, not necessarily losing, you know, focused on what the wildlife might lose, what the wildlife might lose, but you know, the experience that I would lose if my campground is sort of messed up by wildlife, food is scattered or taken away by law enforcement. Um, you know, and I just want to note that if enforcement is a random occurrence, um, it's not necessarily going to be a major motivator. It's more, you know, am I going to get caught? Probably not. Um, what are the, the bigger motivators for me storing my food properly? Strategies here included trip planning information, um, both prior to camping and once you arrived at the site. And that focused on um, elements, oops here, I can barely see it myself. I hope you guys can see it. But wildlife getting into campers thing has been a problem for wildlife alike. So it highlights the problem. Um, other elements are focusing on the dynamic norm that more and more people are doing this. So you really want to be like more and more people. Um, that's what the community does. And then adding that little bit about what might happen if you don't. And it's not, uh, it's focused on, you know, the thing that might experience, impact the experience that I want to have. So my food might be ruined or, you know, other things might happen. She uh, complemented this with prompts at the campsite and then positive feedback. So, you know, congratulations, you're doing the right thing. We see you being a good um, steward of this place and this park. So really reinforcing the behavior in a way that, you know, emphasize somebody's identity as a person who cares about this place. She went out and piloted, um, took very collected data about what you know, they saw, and overall they saw an increase um, in compliance between the locations that saw the market social marketing intervention to, compared to those who did not. Um, really, uh oh, did I just lose my presentation? Okay, just really quickly here, um, our social marketing campaigns you know, are not just about messaging. So this is one that we focus, that we worked on um, to encourage people to use mineral-based sunscreens instead of chemical-based sunscreens, which can be harmful to coral reefs and aquatic resources. It's a very similar thing. We um, focused on identifying behaviors and barriers to those behaviors. We came up with a set of um, interventions that parks could implement based on their staffing and their context. Um, and a couple of those examples included trade-ins. So this was um, a, a intervention that Coloco Honokohau had implemented. And what this does is it alleviates the sort of um, sunk costs, let's say, into um, a bottle of sunscreen and, you know, offer something in exchange. So you've already spent money on this sunscreen either are going to use it, it feels pretty bad to throw it away. So we're in better shape if we can exchange it for the right type of sunscreen. It also helps um, make the choice easier for people because if you've ever stood in Target and tried to select sunscreens, it can be really hard to figure out what you're looking for. So we've made that choice really easy. Um, another example of a sort of site intervention is um, for the sunscreen campaigns um, is to provide sunscreen dispensers. And so this targets people who want to do the right thing, but aren't necessarily prepared. 
Um, maybe they didn't learn about the issue till they already showed up at the place, at the location, at the park. So having something that helps them make that um, shift will nudge them in the direction of making bigger changes in the future. And our pledges is another similar idea to that. It's a step towards doing the right thing. And it'll make me think twice the next time I make my a choice about sunscreen. So in this example, you know, we asked people to make a commitment to purchasing reef friendly sunscreen. And then we show that on a map and we're building that more and more people are doing this idea that that, that dynamic norm over time. So I feel like I probably went over um, I want to thank you for inviting me. There are a lot of resources out here, and these are just a few that um, I look to. There's a ton more to consider. I want to say that I've been really successful collaborating with universities. I think there's a lot of potential out there. Um, I'll mention I took a certificate in sustainability and behavior change from UC San Diego. So they offer that program. It's online. It was really fantastic. Um, and I'm happy to share any other resources or have follow up with any conversations about what we've been doing.